Hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the impact of uh, baritheridectomy uh, in our uh, dialysis patient. And is baritheridectomy good or bad for this patient population? Um, the straightforward answer would be yes or no. And I'm not going to give you this uh, easy answer because the baritheridectomy outcome could be different depending on who's doing the surgery, what's the indication, why, how, when, and where. So it's not a straightforward yes or no for most of uh, our patients. It depends on the circumstances and many, many factors as I'm going to show you in this presentation. First of all, parathyroid gland is one of the pivotal gland in our body. We cannot live without parathyroid gland or its replacement with calcium and vitamin D uh, for five, 10 minutes after uh, you know removing our parathyroid gland. This is the reason that even in, during the surgery, we start the IV calcium and the IV vitamin D in the OR uh, you know, to avoid severe hypocalcemia and seizures. Parathyroid gland is a very important vital organs. And uh, uh, how many times do we have four organs in our uh, body? You know, four copies of the parathyroid gland. Its location is particular. It's, um, uh, you know, covered underneath the thyroid gland. And the thyroid gland is like a shield protects this uh, fighter and uh, hard working gland. Uh, also, the development of the parathyroid gland, it developed very early uh, during the embryonic life, even before full maturation of the heart and uh, um, the cardiovascular and uh, the neurological system, because our cardiovascular and uh, CNS cannot uh, function properly without strict control of the serum calcium level. This uh, um, very hard working gland, we try to calculate how much parathyroid hormone comes out from this gland. And uh, based on the molecular weight and the half life of the parathyroid gland, which is a short half life, usually we have a complete uh, turnover and new BTH every 10 minutes. So it's very short half life hormone. So uh, based on the molecular weight and the half-life, we came in with this calculation. So our parathyroid gland uh, secrete um, more than one quadrillion. So quadrillion is a thousand of trillion or a million of billions. So it's huge amount of BTH secretion. And by the way, uh, most of the BTH secreted um, in our body or um, sensitized in the uh, gland is auto-degraded inside the gland because it's a reservoir, it's a storage inside the gland. So if there is low calcium level, this means that we need more BTH. In this case, 60% of the BTH will be released in the circulation and 40% will be auto-degraded inside the parathyroid gland. But contrary, if we have high calcium level, this means that we don't need a lot of BTH. So only 20% of the BTH will be released in the circulation while 80% will be degraded. So this amount is actually could be double in most of uh, um, the situation we have, uh, you know, in the normal hemostasis. The first parathyroid surgery and uh, uh, removal of the parathyroid tissue for a dialysis patient with ostitis fibrosis cystica was done by uh, Felix Mandel in Vienna in 1925. Of course, by the time, uh, no one knows the uh, BTH. There was no BTH assay, and he just uh, uh, found that in this patient was severe high turnover bone disease and ostitis fibrosis cystica and the increased risk of fracture. They have increased and, uh, you know, um, hyperplasia in their parathyroid gland. So uh, they so thought that removal of the parathyroid gland might help with their bone. 
What we definitely know is the baratheridectomy improves the laboratory parameter in refractory cases of hyperbarothyroidase. So the um, BTH goes down probably significantly. The phosphorus level also goes down, but uh, also the calcium level could go down uh, significantly. But is this going to change the clinical outcome? The hard endpoints like cardiovascular disease, like bone health, patient survival. Um, uh, you know, we need a real, not only a surrogate marker, and we need a patient-centered approach to evaluate and assess the impact of baratheridectomy in our patient. As you know, uh, early on you know, with the CKD progression, there is uh, glandular hyperplasia which increases the number of secretory cells. Initially, it's diffuse enlargement of the gland and it's usually associated with down regulation of vitamin D receptors and calcium sensing receptors. There is polyclonal proliferation of the gland. Uh, then if the BTH is not well controlled and we cannot suppress that and there is a lot of uh, stimulants to increase the BTH, it changes from a compensatory to a pathological increase. It, uh, it changes from adaptive to maladaptive process. Uh, then you can see the gland has um, either early nodularity or later on multi-nodular glandular enlargement by that time, there is severe down regulation of vitamin D receptors and calcium sensitive receptor. So it's very hard in these late stages to control the hyperbara medically because most of the medication we use, they work on the, either on vitamin D receptor or calcium sensing receptor. So by that time, when the BTH goes up to uh, 1200 uh, or more, uh, usually, this is the indication for the surgery, and this is the time that we have failure of medical treatment and the hyperbarothyroidism is severe, refractory, or resistant to medical therapy. The problem is the bone turnover could not be predicted by the BTH levels in about 30% of hemodialysis patients and more than 50% in peritoneal dialysis patients. So the correlation between BTH and uh, uh, the bone turnover is not uh, uh, excellent. It's, it's, you know, it's okay. Uh, and it's the uh, most widely used uh, biomarker to assess the bone turnover. However, it does not uh, uh, give you 100%, uh, um, you know, answer about the bone turnover. Um, in this study, they tried to see what happens in the bone turnover by doing uh, bone histomorphometric studies um, according to the BTH level. So patient with BTH level less than 150, they have 82 per, you know, percent of low turnover bone disease. If the BTH in dialysis patient is between 150 to 300, still two thirds of this patient has low turnover bone disease and about one third have high turnover bone disease. Even if the BTH is more than 300, still there is 37% chance of low turnover bone disease and 62% uh, of uh, high turnover bone disease. Of course, you know, when the BTH is above 800, 900, the, uh, you can say with uh, very good certainty and precision that this patient has high turnover bone disease. So the Kidoki recommended IBTH level did not prevent low bone turnover disease in hemodialysis patients. And the problem is more, uh, especially in African American or black population, because BTH level was not significant predictor of bone turnover in this population. As we know that the low turnover bone disease now is more common, about 58 to 60% of our dialysis patients have um, low turnover bone disease, uh, while high turnover bone disease was only found in one quarter of patients, and normal bone is in less than 20% uh, of patients. 
this led to um, more liberty and treating our uh, hyperpara patients because um, the paradigm shift we have from high to low turnover bone disease and the prevalence of low turnover bone disease led the nephrologist to be more liberal and accept higher level of BTH. As you see, the mean BTH level went up, especially in African-American population to 551 and in white population to 410. The problem is these studies are mainly done in uh, the Western countries, but uh, when it, it comes to the Middle East or African or Asian population, the results might be different. We know that high BTH is bad, but uh, contrary, low BTH also is, is very bad, especially very low number in dialysis vision less than uh, 100, less than three digits number. You see steep increase in a patient uh, a hazard ratio of mortality. The other problem, we need to identify what is a successful baratheridectomy because removing this pivotal and uh, vital gland and put it in the garbage or the trash uh, is not uh, uh, successful or achievements. Actually, it's a failure, failure of medical treatment and uh, uh, it's, it's uh, not uh, uh, you know, success to remove such vital gland. If you go to the literature, there is uh, some literature saying that successful baratheridectomy is to attain BTH reduction more than 80% or to keep the BTH less than 60. And um, the surgeon also are very concerned by the failure of uh, the surgery. So they don't want to uh, reoperate in this patient. So they consider the surgery successful if they don't have to go back and to do another procedure. However, this old definition doesn't give a lower cut of values for the BTH. So uh, a BTH, you know, decrease of 80% or BTH of less than 60, this could induce actually hypoparathyroidism in our dialysis patient because we need BTH to avoid low turnover bone disease and adynamic bone disease in our patient. Um, so it's important to come up with a cut of points and to prevent the iatrogenic hypopara and hypocalcemia and low turnover bone disease in our patient. You see in this uh, study, they try to uh, compare total baratheridectomy without or with autotransplantation. At all times, there was no difference in the BTH, but only at 36 months, the BTH level were uh, significantly lower in patients who did not get uh, the autotransplantation. It took three years. But most importantly, the BTH was less than 75 nanogram in more than 90% of the population. In dialysis patients, that's not good. The mean BTH at this charge after the surgery was 54 uh, nanogram, and it was uh, at three years, 24 in patients who did not get autotransplantation compared to 75 in those who uh, received autotransplantation. Both are still low. Of course, at uh, three years, the patient who did not get autotransplantation had lower number, but even if they get the autotransplantation, they still have low BTH. This study, they identified successful baratheridectomy as patient who had at least 90, um, you know, percent decrease in their uh, BTH. They um, evaluated more than 500 patients and successful baratheridectomy was defined as high BTH less than 300, 90% had successful surgery and 10% had persistent secondary hyperbara. And the question is, as you can see here, the BTH was very, very low in most uh, of, of patients. And the question is, in these 90% um, you know, uh, of patients when they consider it uh, successful surgery, some of them, they have uh, unidentified or unmeasurable BTH. Is this 
uh, success. I don't think this is success. On the other hand, the patient who said they failed uh, the parathyroidectomy because they have PTH of 300 for me, if I have a patient with a PTH after parathyroidectomy of 300, 350, or even 400, it shouldn't be a problem. And I can lower down this by using uh, medical treatment. But when it comes to persistent hypobar, it's very hard to deal with these patients after the surgery. We also examined um, you know, the impact of parathyroidectomy in uh, our dialysis and transplant patients. Actually, 90% of our patient has IPTH less than 150 picogram per ml over five years period. We did a long-term follow-up study. And 31% of our patients were readmitted within 90 days of the surgery, mostly because of hypocalcemia. And about uh, uh, three quarter of patients, the admission was because of the hypopara uh, thyroidase. So, um, barotheridectomy is minimally invasive surgery. However, you see in several studies, it's not very uh, benign or safe surgery. The all cause hospitalization, when they compared uh, these dialysis patients prior and after the surgery, the all-cause hospitalization is higher, especially the all-cause hospitalization because of the hypocalcemia is extremely high, and also the ER visit and observation because of hypocalcemia is very, very high. You see even the mortality, there is some mortality risk uh, very early on. This is inpatient mortality. So this is usually within the first week the patient dies, used to be around 2%. Now it's a little bit better with using the minimal invasive techniques down to 1%, but still there is a risk of very early mortality. The trend of barotheridectomy in various studies, we can see that uh, you know, the need for barotheridectomy is um, declining nowadays with use of uh, vitamin D analogs and calcium mimetics. This study was uh, done uh, in kidney transplant patient, and they found that almost one fifth of the kidney transplant patient who uh, you know, was followed up after six months of the surgery uh, of the kidney transplantation, they either needed barotheridectomy or senacalcid, and this was three year uh, follow up uh, study. The rate of barotheridectomy after transplantation was unchanged, but senacalcid use increased during the study period. One fourth of patients were hospitalized within the first 90 days because of mainly because of the hypocalcemia. Longer dialysis vintage and pre-transplant senacalcid use were strongly associated with both transplant barotheridectomy. The senacalcid use was common, about 18% of uh, uh, patients uh, six months after transplantation, they still need uh, senacalcid, and uh, a small fraction will need barotheridectomy. Especially after use of the IV calcium mimetic eticalcetides, the parcipel, that is very uh, you know, uh, efficient in controlling um, the uh, BTH secretion, especially and a patient who had the problem with their compliance to oral medication or adherence to treatment, 89% of patients had more than 30% reduction of their BTH with a mean of 53.6% decrease in the PTH. So even if you start with a BTH level of 1,000, you can get it down to 530 or something like that. So use of IV calcium mimetic might be also helpful to decrease the rate and the need for barotheridectomy. The other question is, do we need bone biopsy before doing barotheridectomy? We published this, studies, uh, this study um, last decade. And uh, the problem with um, barotheridectomy, it can worsen the, the aluminum intoxication and also the non-aluminum related osteomalacia and adynamic bone disease, especially if hypobara uh, is uh, induced. So we have to be careful. If the BTH is you know, more than 1,200 or so, you can say with certainty that this patient has high turnover bone disease. 
and uh, we just need to do a gentle parathyroidectomy without inducing, uh, you know, hypoparathyroidism and a dynamic bone disease. But um, if you are not very certain, yes, you need to do bone biopsy to make sure that the patient has stice fibrosis cystica and severe degree of high renal. Um, this study showed that the bone formation could improve and the bone remodeling could improve after uh, parathyroidectomy. BTH definitely goes down after the surgery from here, a mean of about 900 to very low level. Again, you know, less than 100. Is this good or bad? This is another thing we need to discuss. Serum calcium initially because of the Hunkery bone syndrome goes down, then hopefully it's stabilized, especially in patients who are getting gentle um, parathyroidectomy without inducing permanent hypoparathyroidism. Serum phosphorus level definitely goes down. FGF23 and this study went down, especially in the first uh, one month, then plateaued, and the clotho went up uh, you know, very early on. So this could have a positive uh, implication on our beef. Several um, retrospective studies showed that the parathyroidectomy could improve some of our patients' outcome, like stroke, uh, uh, peripheral artery disease, restless leg syndrome, even survival of this patient could improve. And here, these are um, meta-analysis showing that, um, you know, in favor of parathyroidectomy, there is uh, several studies uh, showed that favor of reduction of all-cause mortality about 28% reduction in all cause mortality and 37% reduction in cardiovascular mortality after parathyroidectomy. But the problem, there is a lot of bias in this study. It's very hard to compare uh, patients who are getting parathyroidectomy to patients who are getting medical treatment. And I'll show you why this happened. And this study actually they found that a spontaneous decline in parathyroid hormone level in patients with acute comorbid condition were associated with higher or the highest risk of death within five years compared to BTH reduction because of medical treatment or surgical treatment. This, um, you know, median survival were for 10 months and 20 months for this patient with uh, spontaneous compared to the um, medical treatment decrease in the BTH secretion. And uh, the main acute comorbidity that led to decrease of the BTH uh, was peripheral vascular disease, cardiac complications, sepsis fracture, and cancer. So BTH can go down because of uh, uh, several comorbidities, and this group of patients will have the worst outcome. Here, you know, patient with a spontaneous decrease of BTH due to comorbidities is without medication. Their survival is very poor compared even to patients who had higher BTH level. If you control it medically, you get better outcome. And here are the vision who had parathyroidectomy. They have the best outcome, but I'll show you that there is a bias because these patients were, you know, younger, 51 year old compared to 60s and 70s in other patients. Zero percentage of uh, diabetes, lower cardiovascular disease low or, you know, none of them had peripheral vascular disease or stroke. And the uh, dialysis session time was higher. So of course there is bias. I mean, who uh, is going to end up by having the surgery? Uh, the answer is, are these patients with the lowest risk of surgical morbidity and the mortality. So patients who are healthier are those who are getting the surgeries and patients who have a lot of comorbidities are those who we are not going to refer them to do parathyroidectomy. Again, several other studies showed improvement or uh, you know, better survival outcome comparing BTX to the parathyroidectomy patient to non-parathyroidectomy patient. It's uh, interesting and funny because you see this study that was published in New England Journal of Medicine and you see if, from, if you are from Switzerland and if you consume more chocolate, probably you will have better chance of getting Nobel Prize. Is this the impact of chocolate 
uh, you know, that will uh, lead you to be a Nobel Prize man or woman? Of course not, because there's uh, many, uh, you know, if you are from China and if you consume less chocolate, you have zero chance of uh, uh, getting the Nobel Prize. Of course, there is a lot of, uh, you know, genetic and environmental factor. It's not the impact of chocolate by itself. It's uh, the impact of other, you know, um, the risk factors and environmental and genetic uh, uh, determinants and variables that can impact the outcome. So there is a lot of bias here. So we have to, uh, you know, uh, see the results of this study uh, very carefully and to be vigilant. So again, we need to know what is the indication of baratheridectomy and we need to identify the contraindication, choose the surgical, you know, patients who have the lowest risk of uh, uh, morbidity and mortality. We need to consent the patient in a randomized controlled fashion, either to receive surgical or medical treatment and we need to follow them for uh, enough period of time to be able to answer such complicated questions. In this study, they um, tried to match uh, these patients uh, and they did the, the short-term follow-up uh, in a retrospective study. And also uh, the matched control group had a higher um, risk of uh, mortality compared to patients with parathyroid gland. Whatever matching you're doing is not going to solve the problem. Uh, here there is a commentary that was written by Miles Wolf and Julia, and they mentioned that in the retrospective study, you need to start early, you need to observe the indication, and uh, you need uh, to see, uh, observe the outcome for a long uh, period of uh, time. Same thing for, you know, in a prospective fashion, you need to start early, you need to wash out these patients first and to watch them before the surgery, then during and, uh, you know, um, enough time for several years after the surgery. The other problem is we need to identify the indication for baratheridectomy. Is it only based on the BTH level? Of course, most of the studies we focus on the indication based on the BTH level. In Japan and Taiwan and most of the Asian countries they use lower uh, BTH cut off points for baratheridectomy, usually around 500. In Europe, there is no clear cut off uh, criteria, but most of literature they use a BTH level between 500 to 1500. In America, actually most of baratheridectomy is done uh, in patients with at least a BTH of 800 and some, especially in the last decade, they are limited for patients who have BTH level more than 1200, but again, no clear uh, cut criteria. And the mean BTH level in most of the study was about 1500, so much higher compared to uh, you know, Asian country. But the decision shouldn't be only based on the BTH level, because as we mentioned, BTH doesn't correlate 100% of the time with the bone turnover. So uh, we don't see, you know, any studies that, uh, um, uh, you know, do baratheridectomy based on the bone pathology or the bone disease or bone loss or risk of fracture or the cardiovascular disease, for, for example. So we only focus on the BTH, which is one of the bone turnover biomarkers. Also, the surgical techniques, um, we have many. We have uh, subtotal baratheridectomy when you remove uh, three plus more than half of the gland. This could be done without or with thymectomy. And also, we have another uh, surgery that we remove all the gland, so total baratheridectomy, and it's usually done with Barathyroid gland autotransplantation, most commonly in the forearm, but it can be also uh, implanted in the thigh or the neck. Some centers, they uh, cryopreserve the, uh, some of the barathyroid tissue just in case if patient develop hypobara, it can be autotransplanted. Again, the viability of these cells depends on the preservation and the duration but most of the studies 
you know, after uh, three to six months, the viability of the cells are very, very poor. Uh, so doing thymectomy with baratheridectomy, it, uh, we uh, thought that it's a safe procedure, but uh, in uh, you know recent article that was published August 2023, they found that the relative risk of death is higher in the five-year uh, follow-up study about more than two folds higher risk of mortality. It's not only this, but also that these patients have higher chance of having cancer and autoimmune diseases. So it seems that doing thymectomy uh, might not be a good option or safe at least uh, uh, surgery with the long-term uh, outcome in our patient uh, with increased risk of death and cancer and autoimmune disease. The other risk of baratheridectomy is inducing uh, hypoparathyroid bone disease, adynamic bone disease, and also increasing cardiovascular calcification. This is a prospective study that was done in San Paulo, Brazil, and um, they followed 19 patients. They did bone histomorphometry studies before and one year after the baratheridectomy, and also they did cardiovascular calcification score by multi-slice CT, and what they found that 90% of patients end up by having low turnover bone disease. 80% of patients had very low bone turnover. And the bone turnover, the lower the bone turnover, the higher risk of cardiovascular calcification happened to this patient. So again, baratheidoctin could induce uh, low turnover bone disease in a majority of patients, and this could be associated with increased risk of cardiovascular calcification. Um, this is a randomized study, uh, one of the few RCTs uh, comparing baratheridectomy uh, to the medical treatment sinacalcid for treating hypercalcemia in kidney transplant patients. Okay? Um, so the, the indication for the baratheidectomy was either hypercalcemia or persistent hyperbara six months after the surgery. And uh, the patient should have at least a GFR of more than 30. Then they did subtotal baratheidectomy and, uh, and half of the patient and 15 patients, and they compare it to 15 patients who are random uh, to receive sinacalcid. And of course, it's open label study. And subtotal baratheidectomy induced greater reduction of BTH. Of course, we know that this will happen. It's an effective uh, surgery. And it was associated with significant increase in femur neck bone mineral density. Vascular calcification remained unchanged in both groups. So it was not helpful for the vascular calcification. But here in the study, Baratheridectomy was help, helpful for the femur neck BMD. As you can see here, the BMD at 12 months, uh, you know, it was significantly higher and the percentage of the femur, the change of the femur neck BMD was significantly uh, higher in patients who had baratheridectomy. They uh, followed up this patient in a long-term uh, follow-up study for five years. These were the 30 patients, but they end up by having 13 and 11 patients in each arm, either in the sinacalcet arm or in the baratheridectomy arm. As you can see here in this long-term follow-up study that was published in 2022, the calcium values for patients who had baratheridectomy were lower and the BTH level was you know, significantly lower in these patients as well. Okay, when it comes to patients uh, uh, on dialysis, this is the only uh, randomized clinical study, that, uh, you know, to my knowledge, uh, that I came across, who, com you know, uh, they compared the baratheridectomy to the medical treatment with sinacalcid, and it, it was in a good number of patients and they followed them up for one year. Both sinacalcid and baratheidectomy effectively controlled advanced secondary hyperbara and improved biochemical parameter 
but it didn't impact coronary artery calcification or left ventricular mass index by cardiac MRI. So uh, there was no significance. So, so there was improvement of biochemical parameter, but there was no improvement in cardiovascular uh, outcome in these patients. So the era editor position statement, the CKD MVD working group, they said there is insufficient evidence whether baritheridectomy or medical treatment should be preferred to control secondary hyperbara in dialysis patient. So that's very important. So we still till 2015 have uh, insufficient evidence which one is better. In 2017, the clinical practice CKD and BD KDGO guideline were published and uh, they uh, suggested that in patients with CKD stage 3A to 5D with severe hyperbarothyroidism who fail to respond to medical or pharmacological therapy, they suggested barothyroidism. Okay, so just a suggestion, not recommendation, because the level of evidence is 2B. And they mentioned it's only, it's not comparing this to this. No, the indication is different. The indication for barothyroidectomy is for those who fail medical or pharmacological therapy. And by the way, medical is not the same as pharmacological because we need to use lifestyle modification, diet, you know, and uh, other factors. Not everything is, is medicine. And we can talk about this in, in, in a different lecture pharmacological and non-pharmacological intervention because pharmacological is as you know as important as non-pharmacological intervention uh, to treat the CKD MPD. But again, bottom line is there is no comparison. The indication is different. You need to do the surgery if you feel the medical treatment. So let us uh, summarize here benefit and cost, pros and cons of uh, medical and surgical treatment. So the benefit of surgical treatment for hyperparathyroidism, it's, it's curative, but the risk is it's, you know, majority of patients will develop hypoparathyroidism, so will it change the spectrum from high turnover to low turnover disease. Um, it's a definitive surgery, but there is no uh, way to return. It's a, it's a point of no return. Uh, it could be less expensive, but to uh, remove a vital uh, gland and to put it in the trash is um, not the way to go if you can control it medically. Avoid long-term medication side effects, but you need to know that uh, you know, the vast majority of patients after birth they will need vitamin D and calcium, sometimes mega doses of both to control the severe hypocalcemia. It's minimally invasive, but as we discussed, it has also uh, several uh, complications and risks. So um, there is a bias and difficult comparison. It's uh, uh, almost impossible to compare uh, surgical to medical uh, therapies in this situation. The indications are, are, are different. There is no BTH cut off levels. So in this patient need to identify, are we targeting the same two to nine folds of higher uh, uh, upper limit of normal of the BTH? So you, you need to keep the BTH between 150 to 500 or 600 according to your lab reference value in this patient as in uh, other patient without barotheridectomy. The cut of BTH level are different. The indication also, we need to identify what are the indication, uh, not only based on the BTH, but also on other patient-centered outcome, on the bone disease, on the cardiovascular risk. We need to talk to the surgeon and teach the surgeon and have dialogue about our BTH target level. This is not a primary hyperbara. We don't treat this as a tumor and we need BTH to maintain the bone remodeling and bone turnover, and be ready to treat hypobarothyroidism after the barothyroidectomy. Talk to the surgeon to be gentle, not to remove most of the gland and end up by having hypobara because it is not going to help you with, that, with this. We are going to be left with the patients for years and years with severe hypobara and a dynamic bone disease, then we need to deal 
with that. And, uh, you know, again, that's another talk how to control the adynamic bone disease after um, the parathyroidectomy. So your friend today may be your uh, enemy tomorrow. Um, so have it in your mind. Hopefully we are not killing our today's enemy because today's enemy could be a friend tomorrow, could be helpful. So we need uh, not to kill our enemies. We need to know and to learn how to deal with our enemy to get uh, you know, a win-win situation and to avoid risk and avoid inducing harm. Thank you so much. And if you have any question, feel free to contact me at uh, uh, my email address, amr.alfasini at walletkidneyacademy.org. Uh, Thank you.